Hi, I'm Martin Pritikin, the Dean of Concord Law School at Purdue University Global, the nation's first fully online law school. Welcome to this latest installment in our Distinguished Speaker webinar series on the topic of the power of Black women in the law, past, present, and future perspectives. This is a fitting topic given that last month was Black History Month, and this month is Women's History Month. It's also a fitting topic for Concord, since the school's mission since its founding in 1998 has been to create an affordable and accessible path to high quality legal education for those who could not sit in traditional law school within their lives, budgets, and schedules. And both women and people of color have historically been uh, underrepresented both in law school and in the legal profession. Now we're actually gonna follow a slightly different format than usual this time. Instead of moderating myself, I'm going to introduce our moderator and our other panelists. First is Shakira Algorin, who will serve as the moderator as well as one of our panelists. She's an adjunct professor at Concord Law School and is deputy executive director of the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety and Office of High Crimes in New York City. She previously held the position of senior counsel in the Crime Strategy Unit, and before that, she worked as a senior trial attorney with the Legal Aid Society of Brooklyn. Our second panelist is Alasia Black Hackett, the Deputy Chief Diversity Officer for the Commonwealth of Virginia Governor's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Ms. Hackett has 20 years of executive level diversity leadership, including as the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Mars Hill University in North Carolina. Among other advanced degrees, Ms. Hackett earned an Executive Juris Doctor degree from Concord Law School. Last but not least, and representing the uh, private sector, is Valencia Macon, currently the head of U.S. Mergers and Acquisitions Legal Group at Siemens Energy, Inc. Ms. Macon has practiced in corporate law for over 25 years, including as an associate at the law firm of Paul Hastings, Janofsky & Walker, LLP. And although she doesn't have any affiliation with Concord, we will forgive her that, and uh, we're happy to have her here. We're happy to have all of our speakers participate today and taking time out of their busy schedules to have this discussion. And Shakira, I wanna thank you so much for agreeing to moderate this session. I'll now turn it over to you to lead the discussion. Thank you so much, Dean. And this is so exciting. So excited to celebrate Women's History Month with Concord Law School and very excited to be on the dais, if you will, although virtual, with two dynamic Black women attorneys. Um, and there's so many of, across America, of course, but I'm so excited to be with Ms. Hackett and Ms. Macon. And so I was just thinking about trailblazers um, and so many Black women attorneys that have, have done so many historical things. And the first that came to my mind happened to be Sadie Tanner Moselle Alexander, who is um, from the alma mater of Miss Macon, the University of Pennsylvania. She was the first African-American to earn a PhD in economics and the first woman to earn a law degree from the University of Pennsylvania. So considering that, um, ladies, are there any Black women attorneys that inspired you to pursue the practice of law? If so, who are they? And, and maybe if not, are there any that you admire today? Ms. Macon, we'll start with you first. This is your alma mater I mentioned. Thank you, Shakira. Um, I wish I really could say that there were just one that uh, inspired me, but unfortunately I came up through a time uh, I didn't have a lot of examples. Um, I didn't have a lot of people in front of me. I, a lot of, um, I came to the practice of law following the herd. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do uh, when I went to college and everybody was applying to law school and just seemed like something else to do uh, rather than job at the time. Uh, but since I've been practicing law, I have met some women, some women of color who are really inspirational. And one in particular, She's actually a friend of mine. She's a, a black woman general counsel of a traded company. Uh, she worked her way up to all the major law firms to managing director. And to anyone who knows that, to be a black woman and a managing director of a major firm uh, is uh, quite an achievement and an accomplishment. But more importantly, it's not just her title that she's achieved, but she really believes in giving back. Uh, she promotes uh, women of color, people of color. She uh, speaks on many panels. She bridges gaps. She leads the way. She guides. She mentors. Uh, she offers herself in every way possible um, to help people achieve what she's achieved and show them. Uh, 
Um, her new initiative now is to get more color or more women of color on public company boards, which is an area that's been pretty much uh, an enigma to a lot of us. Uh, we don't really know what that path forward is. She sits on a couple of boards. So she is sort of writing the script that this is what you need, this is the experience you need to get if that's what you that's um, a goal of yours. Um, and so she's really on the ground for really helping to pull up. And I think that's so important once you get to a certain level uh, to, uh, to, give, to give back in that way. So she's a living example of that. And that's why she's my inspiration. Thank you so much. Ms. Black Hackett, who's your inspiration? Well, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much like Ms. Macon. I did not have anyone growing up. Um, actually, law was not the direction that I thought I would go in. Um, it actually something that I became passionate about when a family member experienced um, being criminalized. And I just felt like our people didn't have enough information about law to understand and interpret it. But I would say, because I'm in government, that the first um, woman who really caught my attention, that, that was a Black woman in, I guess you would say, kind of the scope of law was Condoleezza Rice. And I just believe kind of in general, especially our people, black folks did not give her, I guess, the respect I believe um, that she warranted simply because of her party affiliation. Um, but I felt like she was a dynamic woman. She was, you know, quality top, you know, some of her policies are questionable, but um, I believe that she defied a lot of odds before we even knew that we could be in these and sit at these tables. Um, so she was somebody that I, I mean, you know how you kind of, this person got a, a second glance from you. So um, it will be Condoleezza Rice for me. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, I, like you, did not have any um, Black women attorneys that I admired. My mother and father kept saying, you're going to be a doctor, so don't worry. So we see I'm a lawyer, right? So I guess that actually did not happen for them, but they still love me and they're still proud of me. So having said that, um, are you the first person in your family to be an attorney and practice law? Ms. Bacon? I am, I am. I'm a first, first generation college, grad school, uh, professional. Um, it's, it's sad to be the first, but you're all happy that there's others that come behind you and you inspire the members of your family. Uh, that hasn't yet really been the case, but uh, uh, that first comes with the challenges of itself. You don't have, you know, you don't have that sort of guidance. We didn't talk or I sit around the dinner table and speak about mergers and acquisition deals, or certain law cases. And, you know, and I remember, you know, went to law school and, getting firm interviews and not having a clue as to these firms were, what they did, how do I interview, how do I conduct myself? Um, uh, it was all, you know, it was, I sort of felt my way like a blind person in the dark. It was things where I just had no idea if I was stepping in a line mine or if I was you know, putting my foot in my mouth, but uh, you just pay attention, you keep your mouth shut, you watch and do what others do that seem more confident than you are. And you out. Um, so that's one of the drawbacks of being the first, but the benefit is you are the trailblazer. You get to set the stage, um, you kick the door in, and you hope you get to lead others. Wonderful. Ms. Black Hackett? Uh, so yes, I too was first generation everything, first generation to complete um, my uh, bachelor's degree, master's. And I would say that my family probably um, assumed that I would pursue a PhD, which I was. That was definitely, I was in academia as a uh, it was stated in my bio, I was definitely in, you know, higher ed. Um, but again, everything changed um, and I wanted to, to know law. So I didn't have a point of reference. And coming from a very, very firm and strong religious background, um, all lawyers were, law were liars. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, there's still some concern that, that happens even today, you know, with the career that I have now is, you know, hoping that I will keep my ethical standards. Um, but that's just a perception. So you have to kind of really um, gauge above that. And then being a woman of color, not having a lot of those, um, you know, uh, trailblazers ahead that you know about. Now you see a lot of it today, um, but there were, there were none. And, um, you know, I always thought I would be the first of, the first of this. And so unfortunately in 2021, we still have, the first black woman to be a, a vice president of the United States or first black woman to be a CEO of a, um, 
you know, a, five, uh, a, a huge corporation. But again, like Ms. Uh, Macon said, we are tra trailblazers and we've always been trailblazers. And so we just take it on um, and, and let it do what it do. Exactly. And I'm so glad you brought up the PhD component because I think with my family, there are several PhD holders in my family. And I was not the first lawyer. I was actually the second. Um, so it's a generation before me, my cousin, me, and then a younger cousin after me. And we all like graduated from law school within like four years of each other. So um, I, I'm happy not to be the first, but I think that um, definitely the PhD route was the way to go. Um, my mother actually um, was a, it, she has a very long title. She had a, a senior a senior systems computer analyst for the Department of Defense. So she's speaking of government, she was a government employee for 37 years and has like this really crazy high security clearance and all that great stuff. And she said, well, you know, when you graduate, why don't you come work with me? And I was like, I don't want to do that stuff. I don't, mom. And my mother speaks of that. She doesn't speak. She can read code. She builds robots. So nothing for my mother rang legal right? It was computers, computer science. And so when I decided to steer away from the sciences and go into law, like I said, she she said, fine. But I think that um, for our family, going the PhD route was the way to go, right? Um, so I'm glad you actually brought that up. But you know what I was also thinking? Um, in reference to pursuing this, on a personal note, what was your most difficult obstacle in attaining the level of success that you have today? Anyone could go first. Let's have it, why go first? <laughs> <laughs> sure, um, yes, uh, I will be remiss to say, and I'm, 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 I'm very, and I will say this about, I, I feel black women are very transparent um, mm -hmm. and forth coming in, in our responses. Um, but to, one of the challenges I've faced is um, the lack of understanding of, of my blackness as a female professional. Um, you know, there are times that my passion is misinterpreted as, you know, and I'm a DI expert, so I'm gonna tap into it, but an angry black woman. Uh, and so professionally, um, a lot of times I'm, I, we have to, or I have to really soften what would be more of a firm stance in order to not offend and to always think on behalf of those that I'm co uh, collaborating with. Um, and so it, it's been kind of that tough place that you have generations of, of, of professionals who know someone who knows someone. And so it's a lot, it has a lot to do with um, who you know, and so in order to get into these spaces to show that you are capable of a certain job, a lot of times the off opportunities are not there. Um, so it, it took having expertise in diversity, equity, inclusion to get me to where I am. And for me, um, you know, it can be uh, quite challenging if someone didn't have something, you know, like I did to lean on. Uh, because it really is about who you know. Someone is going to refer a friend of their family member. And when we don't have the generations of people in these spaces, it really is hard to, to cross those thresholds. Um, so I would say those are the two things that are most challenging or has been challenging um, in my pursuit in the legal field. Ms. Macon? Um, for me, I've been with the same company now for 20 21, 21 years. Um, and I will say that having been there that long and I had some decent bosses, majority of them up until recently were white males. Um, I had zero mentorship. I had uh, zero development. I had zero guidance. Um, I was literally thrown into, you know, a sink or swim situation. Um, and I was expected to not only swim, but save others. Um, that's a huge obstacle. That's a lot to ask. I don't think it was deliberate, but um, I don't think that, and I got along well and I have nothing. I love my company, enjoy the people that I work with. And my prior bosses were, they were good people, but it, it wasn't in their mind to develop and mentor. So when this opportunity came to become head of the MA group, the group that I was initially hired into, um, I didn't have anyone to push me and tap me on the shoulder and say, why don't you try for that? 
I had to motivate myself. I had to do what I heard in the speech. I had to raise my hand. And I did. And I'm glad I had the confidence and the courage. Um, although I didn't know what I was getting myself into, I raised my hand and I had to go for it because I had to set my own course. I had to set my own career path. And I had to decide what, where I wanted to go. Did I want to sit here and do the same job for another 10 more years or did I want to try and move to the next level? But I really didn't know how to do that. So I just position was open. I raised my hand. I went for it. I interviewed for it and I got it. And I was lost. I was completely, utterly lost because I had never been developed. The people who were, I worked for never showed me what I had no idea what a senior level manager does at that level. And so I spent the next three, four years thinking that somebody was going to tap me on the shoulder and say, I think we made a mistake. Um, and that was really frightening the first few years to figure this out. Um, but, you know, we come from stock that we don't give up. Don't cry and go home. Uh, we sit quiet, we figure it out, we make mistakes, we atone for it, and we hope people are forgiving and we try and do better. And uh, I wanted to make sure that when I got into this role that the people that I hired and the team that I built, they wouldn't be as lost as I was when they moved into my position. So that I got to show them what it means to be a senior level manager. This is what we do, this is what the meetings, this is what you're expected to produce. And so that lack of visibility and transparency that I experienced in my 20 something years of being with my company, um, it really could have been a hindrance to my career if I had allowed it to be so, but uh, uh, I wouldn't have gotten this far if I, if I took no answer. So um, all I can say of anyone who uh, doesn't have mentorship and you're not in a position where people are guiding you, uh, chart your own, go find that person, go and tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you're doing what I think I wanna do. Can I shadow you, help me? talk to me. I didn't have that kind of confidence. I wish I did. Um, I'm teaching my children to have that kind of confidence, but you have to go, you have to go for it. No one's going to hand it to us on a silver platter. And I, I think that's something that uh, um, I wish I had known ahead of time. I sort of just figured it out as I've been going along and I'm still figuring it out because uh, I still wonder what the next level is. I still don't have it, but uh, I got a lot more confidence than I used to have. Wonderful. We, we do have a question from, from the audience, Ms. Macon, and it says, uh, what do you mean by the term keep your mouth shut? And in what context was that meant by? You mentioned that earlier. Oh, I meant in the terms of you would go to meetings and if you don't know what is going on or you're not sure of yourself or you're not sure of uh, what's the most appropriate, I would just be quiet. So I probably wish that I would just be quiet and I would pay attention and I would listen and learn from those around. So rather than jump in and just sort of, I'm here, let me speak first and make myself known, I took a more reserved position of just sort of trying to figure out who the players are, you know, who's the one leading the meetings, what points are important, what, you know, and I tried to observe and read um, before I began to participate. So I took a little bit longer to be engaged, but that was my learning process. That was my training ground. So that's what I meant when I kept my mouth. I was just quiet and I observed. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think in reference to to obstacles, and sometimes it's also an obstacle is learning how to, to read the room, right? So learning whether or not you need to actually contribute verbally, or if you should sit back and just uh, observe and absorb what's happening, right? Um, I think one of my obstacles uh, personally was access to the information, just access to the information. Um, and so I, I, as I have gone through my legal career, I tell people, if I find out about an opportunity, I let my network know as many people as I possibly can, because I don't want younger attorneys or law students or even college students or whoever I happen to be in contact with to not have that information and not benefit from it. So I think um, just trying to figure out how to, how to maneuver that field of information being brought to me so I can disperse it to the masses. Um, and I also think um, just recognizing opportunity where opportunity lies. And an example of that would be um, when I was in law school, um, I, I, I made sure even though law school was difficult and I'm sure everybody had their, their up, ups and downs in law school, I made sure to be involved with community service. And um, a dean actually came to me and asked me to apply for a scholarship for our third year. And it was a scholarship that involved not just a certain grade point average, but you also had to have done community service. And the top of our class had applied to it. And I was the middle and I love the middle. And I actually won the scholarship because I also met the community service requirement. And I just said, guys, you didn't read that part. Um, 
So I had been out for two years building houses with Habitat for Humanity, and I uh, it was a, a it was a Judge Richard E. Richmond and, uh, Fellowship Endowment Scholarship, and I had was awarded the scholarship. But thankfully, that was brought to me by the dean of the school. I didn't even know that scholarship was available. I knew nothing about that, and so I made sure to let other people know that were coming behind me. Make sure you check out this scholarship. It's available for your third year if you do A, B, C, and D. So the dissemination of information, I think, is super important as well to help us get through not just our academic careers, but also our professional careers as well. So um, we do have a question for the, for the audience is asking, um, have either of us had sponsors? In reference to membership is a very important thing. But to have a sponsor, someone who's in the room where it all happens to bring your name up in the right places and at the right times. So have either one of you experienced having a sponsor? I, I can go. I would say that I actually have a sponsor now. Um, and I've been privileged to have that sponsor um, because, you know, truth of the matter is, again, like I mentioned before, it typically it takes you having um, many years of some type of political affiliation or um, working within these spheres of influence mm -hmm. in order for you to sit in the seats that I'm sitting in. Um, so I would say I have this uh, uh, a sponsor who is um, the, the secretary for which I am deputy to. And so we both are DEI experts. We both have higher education um, experience. Both were CDOs within university settings. And, you know, the opportunity um, came forth and she pulled me in, even when I was trying not to do it, you know, um, and literally together we've been holding each other hands. And when there's when there when there are opportunities, um, I'm included in those. I don't have to worry about what's being spoken at tables that I may not be sitting at because I know that um, it's an intention for her to include me in those conversations. So um, I've been privileged to have that and a lot of people have not. Um, and so it's my intent now that I'm here to do the same for someone else to reach down to ensure that other um, women of color, um, actually our entire team now are full of women of color, which I'm very excited about um, to do the same kind of sponsorship. And, and I believe if I had a different you know, secretary or uh, supervisor, whoever, whatever you want to call them, it may not be that if she was not also a woman of color. Thank you. Ms. Macon? Uh, I wish I could say yes, but um, I don't. I don't have a sponsor. Um, I work for a company that is, it's a German company. Uh, so the majority of my colleagues are German. Um, it doesn't mean that any of them couldn't be a sponsor. I just don't think that that is something that is thought about. So to overcome my lack of having a sponsor or a mentor, um, I believe in building relationships with people. So on any deal or transaction that I work on, I try to build a relationship with the team. I build a relationship with business partners. Um, we're on projects that last three or four months. Um, so there's a lot of times we have downtime with their calls. We're speaking to each other daily. At that time, I get to know them. I like to know because uh, at the end of the year, they do sort of what they call a roundtable performance um, review at my job. And so what they do is they'll have people go out and have you work with them and see what you think, that in people's your opinion. So I find that building a relationship over there in an authentic way, uh, it helps during those times when I'm not in the room that quality mm -hmm. things and out. People get to know you. People know you and not see you as a black woman or whatever stereotype or however whatever category they define you by. But they get to know Valencia as a, a person. And you know, we laughed and we shared jokes and had the deal the deal stories to share. Um, it makes a difference. I'm not as worried anymore not being in the room. My name comes up because I know I've built solid relationships. With Excellent. I, I believe in building relationships as well, but also what Ms. Black Hackett was saying, it, it's fantastic to have um, the person that you directly report to, to be your sponsor. Um, I definitely have a few mentors um, that are not necessarily in the workplace at the moment, um, but they've been mentors for years. 
And I wouldn't necessarily call myself a sponsor. I think I'm a connector. So I know so many people who do so many different things. When I hear something, I say, hey, let me introduce you to this person. And maybe you two can can connect and, and do something fantastic together. So I do believe in connecting people because I think... Um, um, it's good karma, number one. But also, um, I'm very invested in my friends and, and colleagues and family members um, pursuing their dreams and pursuing excellence. And so if there's anything I, that I can do to, to assist them in that, I will do that. And if there's resources I can resources or people I can connect them to, I will do that as well. You know, and, and I think in reference to our personal obstacles, um, I wanted to make it a little broader if we could. So I was actually thinking about um, Judge Deborah A. Batts. And so for uh, those who are not familiar, you can Google her. Last name is B-A-T-T-S. Um, she was a federal judge. She actually passed away last year in February of 2020. Um, she was the first openly gay judge in the federal on the federal bench um, and also the first African-American on the faculty at Fordham Law School. So for those of us who live in New York who have attended Fordham Law, um, she was the first African-American faculty member. So I found that to be amazing as well. So we see this Black woman, this Black woman attorney who has to deal with race, gender, and sexual orientation, th those obstacles. What do you think are the larger obstacles um, maybe across the nation that Black women attorneys are facing today? And how can we overcome those obstacles? Ms. Hackett. Um, I mean, there's a small percentage of, you know, Black women attorneys. And for me, I think it's the, so the idea of being, you know, the first or the only person in these spaces. Again, when, you know, one of the ways to build relationships is to um, have experience with someone, to, to, to take time. And when you're, when you're the only person, kind of the only person there, um, everybody is trying to utilize what you present and then stereotype all other women of color in these spaces. Um, and so it, it becomes very weighty to have to ensure that I'm saying the right things and that I'm not being misunderstood because I also represent a line of young women behind me. Um, and so that's an obstacle in itself, because instead of being able to come in 100 percent authentically me, I have to think about how someone else will interpret. Um, so a way to get around that is really, again, um, you use the terminology, be a connector. So begin with these internships and opportunities for, you know, other young women to shadow you know, what you're doing so that, you know, colleagues can get used to being in these spaces with people that look like me. Um, and, and to make it, to normalize it. That's the word I want to use. Let's normalize women of color being in these spaces. Um, I shouldn't be reading about the first anymore. This should be something that is um, normal to see diversity in all spaces, whether it's, you know, I'm a, if, if I'm a woman who is um, bisexual or I'm a woman who is married to a man, whatever it is, it sh we should normalize, you know, that, our our country is very diverse and so there's a lot of intersectional like sectionalism with that so let's normalize people being different and ensuring that we can show up authentically ourselves and not try to present something that's um uh more acceptable because of what what our culture has done I, that's kind of what i want to say with that thank you make it I absolutely agree with Ms. Hackett. Um, so I'm not going to add to that because I think she summed it up, but I give a different perspective. I think this is an obstacle. It's not just Black women. I think it's women right now. Um, we have so much on our shoulders as caregiver, workload, now with the pandemic. Um, you've got to multitask and wear so many different hats and keep balls in the air and still look effortless and, and as if nothing and completely unflappable. Um, I think that's a challenge. I think there needs to be a more expectation. When I sit across you know, these video cameras and I'm looking at a bunch of males, I know that their wives are the backgrounds taking care of their kids. And I know that they don't have to worry about getting up and dinner, what's to eat. But when I'm sitting there and I'm on a 
conference or I'm in the conference call, I've got, you know, four kids, you know, who I know I have to feed and whatever. And I'm so I, my command is constantly thinking of all the other responsibilities that I have. And I think for women, you know, that's a huge challenge for us. We have this, you know, this badge or this, this, this armor that we have got to carry it all. We have got to, we cannot let any of it go. We can't really complain about it. And I just think that maybe there needs to be a little bit more sensitivity in the place uh, to women who work and women who mothers and that there are, we are multi-tasking, we are, have multi, you know, uh, uh, dynamic, but we have a lot of different things we have to do and yet we still get our jobs done. Um, but it would really be nice if the uh, awareness uh, to that, you know, to, to the women that still are doing their jobs, taking care of their families, uh, meeting all the deadlines and expectations, and we're not faltering, but it's taking a toll on us. It's taking a toll on us mentally, physically, and, uh, uh, and emotionally. And uh, I think that needs to be recognized a bit, um, at least wherever you are, whether it be America, public interest, uh, government, um, all of our roles are important and they are heavy. I totally agree. I think you and Ms. Uh, Ms. Hackett really hit the nails on the head. I actually want to take it even a little further, which is um, there's a couple of things I think that are obstacles. First, um, I don't know if anybody read, I believe in the New York Times recently, there was a article about women and the entitlement gap. So we as women don't think that we deserve the same amount of money or more, the same promotions or more. So, um, and I think that's mixed in with a little bit of the imposter syndrome that our credentials aren't good enough because of A, B, C, and D. So I think that women are really starting to recognize that they are just as qualified, if not more. But I think because of maybe how, how they have viewed themselves in society or how they have been reared, um, we aren't as uh, prevalent in requesting um, what we actually deserve as opposed to what we think we deserve. And also we aren't the ones who necessarily negotiate salaries. We're less likely to, to do that as well. So I think that is an obstacle that um, slowly but surely we will overcome. But I also think, I wanted to say something in, in my experience, something as simple as a name can be an obstacle. So research has been done um, that names um, that ring to a certain culture or sound a certain way, those resumes are not necessarily reviewed as opposed to names that sound very plain or et cetera, right? So there's been so much research behind how people of color have tried to change their resumes to increase their opportunities to get just a job interview, the Harvard um, uh, business school actually did an article about it, um, I think back in 2017. And so my maiden name is Shakira Shahid. And so people make a lot of assumptions. Oh, you must be Muslim. No, I'm actually Catholic. Oh, you must be. No, I'm the, no, you must. And I'm like, hi, stop, please. It's just Shakira. It's just who I am. Um, and so having, asking a lot of those questions and not wanting to be rude in the job interview because I actually want the job. That's why I came today, right? Um, and so I think that has been an obstacle, but I'm actually very hopeful about it because I know a lot of HR professionals, a lot of HR spaces, human resources spaces are really focusing on that. They are assigning random numbers to resumes. They're doing other things to to take out that implicit bias about names that they see on resumes. So I think those are, are some of the uh, obstacles that we face, but um, our audience is asking something that we actually didn't talk about. And that's in reference to age. So do you have a strategy for someone who is just getting into law, but is of a seasoned age? Um, this person has been at their company for 25 years, but they are a first year law student. So what suggestions would you have for that individual? Yes, I think I can answer that. I, I mean, I, I know I look young. I'm a little older than I look. <laughs> you know, I was gonna say black don't crack, but y'all know what y'all know what's said. <laughs> um, but I spent again 20 years in higher education, so um, this is literally a new career for me. It's something that again, um, I feel like actually I've come full circle. I kind of thought I would be in politics, maybe. Um, but I never really thought it would be, you know, to this extent. Um, so it, it was strange. It was, again, strange. I did not do law school to change my career necessarily, but my career came to me. 
So after being 20 years in various administrative positions um, in the university setting, I've been at historically Black college and universities. I've been at private schools, state schools, um, and I changed my career. So it is possible. Um, I know that at Concord, um, there are externships. I say take advantage of that. Um, really take advantage of the Career Center. And there are opportunities. I think what we sometimes do is limit ourselves um, on, our, on taking what we're doing now and use it as transferable skills. Um, and so when you can find someone to help you really extrapolate your skills from what you've been doing, and um, make them transferable. I think there is the possibility of a career in law because again, I spent 20 years in higher education. I was probably, I've, I've taught classes and I was on my way to professorship. Nobody could tell me anything different. Um, and now I'm, I'm settled in this new opportunity and I'm enjoying it. It's almost like I have a fresh wind. So um, starting older doesn't mean anything. There are so many, uh, careers in law that's not just the practice of law. Um, and so uh, just make sure you ask the right questions. Thank you. Ms. Bacon, I know you've been with Siemens for a long time, but you have moved up the ladder, so you have made changes as well. So could, could you speak to this first-year law student? Um, sure. And I would say um, I've seen all different types of resumes. It's a huge red flag that I've seen with older whether it's second careers is they don't care they graduated from college on their resumes. <laughs> so they remove their dates. Um, so people will focus more on their experience and not on, oh, you graduated from college in May 85. You know, so they don't they don't focus on that. Um, so that's a suggestion if you would like to try that. It's not lying. It's a mission people ask. Uh, be honest. Say how much. But I find that people who come back as a second career to the law are better candidates. They have more experience. They're less temperamental. They're more stable. They know what they want to do. Uh, I think person who asked that question cannot have any issues about your age going back into it. You bring a wealth of knowledge, bring a wealth of experience. You have a lot on you, a lot of young snappers, that tells my age that term, uh, may not have. Um, and what you will have is that uh, you want to stick with something probably more long term and not necessarily jump around. So there are lots of benefits depending upon what your prior career was before you switched into law. I don't think you should be afraid of the fact that you're an old and coming into it. I think, I mean, maybe perhaps you might not want to apply to a tech company. So maybe you want to be about focused about where you want to do searches or where you start your career because tech tends to, you know, lean more towards like millennials or the younger generation. But if you go with more traditional companies and, uh, uh, you know, more established ones that have been around, your age could actually be a benefit. And I think that's what you should focus on. How your age and experience actually makes you a better candidate for this position because you're bringing something that your people you're competing with not have. And that's what you up. Wonderful. Thank you. I would just think that, you know, I actually went to graduate school before I went to law school. And so um, I have that experience. And then my law school class, I went to Southern Illinois University um, School of Law. Yay, Salukis. And um, my law class, our age group, I think our youngest student was 22. Our oldest student, I believe, was 67. So we had a huge age range and people were on, a lot of uh, students were on their second or third careers, if you will, retired and decided, I want to put up my own shingle. So that's what I'm going to do. So I think to that student, um, first of all, we're glad you decided to pursue the study of law. Um, and we think that, you know, with the information that Ms. Macon and Ms. Hackett gave you, that you will definitely do well and be successful. So thank you for that question. Um, actually, I want to mention, um, Ms. Hackett, I think you were talking about our, our Madam Vice President and um, talking about just perceptions and of how Black women are perceived um, in the area of law. She being the first Black woman, uh, a Black, I'm sorry, woman of Black and Indian descent, who's also the attorney, uh, attorney general of the state of great, great state of California. Um, how do you think that her ascending to the vice presidency um, has affected society's uh, perceptions of Black women in the legal field? And also, how do you think it's affected Black women's perceptions of themselves? Ms. Macon? Oh, well, um... I think she's definitely an inspiration, especially to young girls. Um, uh, for me, it's just another example of set of minds too, um, that things that may have seemed not attainable, um, 
She carries herself as very decisive, very confident, uh, a lot of strength. Um, I think she's got to be a little bit careful with that because I think there's a perception off too strong or too forceful, we come off too aggressive. Characteristics that are, you know, lauded by and praised and, and males are is a negative for us. So I think that's a fine line. But I mean, sh she's she's owning it. Um, so I, I think that lets us know that uh, you know, when we walk into a room, I mean, we should own it as well. I mean, she commands attention, and I think we do too because automatically we sort of stand out because we really are the only in there, and attention is going to come to us. But what do you do with that attention once you have it? Run from that spotlight, and you can stand in it, and you're gonna yourself. She has definitely done that, and represented herself, and it makes us all proud. Um, so I, I just think it's just another representation of what I could achieve. And I, that's I think the biggest lesson you know, that she's that she sent it to to. Thank you, Miss Hackett. Well, so my response would be. I believe that Madam Vice President, who is also my sorority sister, if I could just throw that plug in. Sure, of course. Um, <laughs> of course. Um, I, I believe her positioning now causes the nation to see Black women in law and to see Black women overall, because this is not her first, um, you know, she didn't just start this, this journey. She's been doing this for some time. And... Um, I believe that her elevation to this place, just like it has been for historical black colleges and university, um, people see us now. So we exist, not that we were not making strides and you know breaking glass ceilings before, but now you cannot ignore the fact that she's accomplished this and she's done it standing on the shoulders of many others. So I would say for women um, of color and women all over, I think this is just the, the time for women to rule the world. I really do, we are the answers and I love men um, and I love what my brothers and sisters do, but I just really believe that this is the, this is the season for the woman to advance. Um, and I, I believe that it won't make it easier, but you cannot ignore the women in the room anymore. It's been easy. You know, there have been times I've been uh, in board meetings and, you know, there are men in the room that just thinks it's okay to, to talk over me. <laughs> um, I was wondering how that worked out for them, but it's not okay. You know, in my previous position, you know, and at one point I would allow it, but then I had to think about this is unacceptable mm -hmm. um, and we'll correct it you know, after the meeting by ourselves, but as far as this board meeting, I'm gonna keep talking. Um, so it's so easy to ignore the women at the table, the black women at the table. Um, I believe with my, Madam Vice President Kamala Harris, you can no longer ignore us. We are, we're to be reckoned with and we're here to stay. So uh, I think that it, it makes it, um, it, it puts us in, in line now um, to be considered. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think Ms. Macon just brought up a, a point of, of, about being the only one in the room. And so one of our audience members is asking, you know, considering that only 5% of lawyers are Black, um, could we speak on what it's like to be the only one in the room at times and how not to let that discourage you? Yeah, um, I think this one is going to have a lot to do with your comfort level your confidence in yourself, uh, the different environments that you were raised in. I will be honest, um, it can be daunting if you allow it to be. Um, fortunately, I happened to grow up, I went to an independent school growing up. Um, so I was used to environments where I was probably the only one or one. So it did get a little bit more intimidating when I moved to the professional world and I'm sitting around a boardroom and I'm old, black there. Um, so yeah, that is probably what made me more reticent. It made me a little bit more introverted. Um, it took a while for that confidence in myself to come out, but I would say that you really got to know, really have to be confident in your abilities. Um, and, you, and, and, and in the beginning, I wasn't. So I was the person who probably stayed from that spotlight because I didn't want to be. Uh, but that's not career enhancing, that's career hindering. So um, I had to learn to be like, I deserve to be here. And I'd have little conversations in my head. And I had to go through this sort of whole 
ritual in order to get myself to a point where I'm like, okay, you know, I am. But like I said, I started around just being friendly and social and talking to people and getting to know them. And then when I sat in a room with people, I knew them as people and they were less intimidating to me. Um, so that's where the building the relationships helps. But it can be, but fall back on what you know. You wouldn't have gotten that far if you didn't be in that room if you didn't know where so nobody invited you there just because they thought you were cute. They invited you there because you had something to offer. So make sure you let them know before you leave and you give them the reason why. Oh, that's why we, that she's here. And you make sure that they know that when I made sure when I walk in the room, somebody is going to remember my name and they're going to remember something that I said. And it became a personal game to me to make any of these things. I'm going to make sure that I shake a hand or I'm going to. Do, I did that and I didn't leave before I made some kind of connection or some kind of an impression, but a positive one. One where people were like, oh, I remember. And they would come back and they would tell me later, I remember that conversation that we had. And I was like, great, because I didn't remember, but they did. And that was important to me. So uh, don't be intimidated. Everyone is a person. Everyone has challenges. Everyone, you know, we all have the same bodily functions. I mean, we are all people. Think on that first, that no one is up here and you're here and you're not there because people just are being kind to you. And then, you know, it's you're not a, a homeless person that everyone is like, oh, I just want to give you a little something. No, no one has time for that. You're there because you deserve to be there. And that's what you need to walk in and keep it on when you walk into a room. It's okay. Somebody has to be there. Be happy it's you. Wonderful. Let's hack it. So yes, uh, I agree with everything you said. Uh, my, again, I, I am a DEI expert. So anytime I go into a meeting, uh, I would, I used to say this could be the meeting that I get fired at, you know, because I was hired to have the hard conversations. I was hired to ruffle feathers, but everybody doesn't want their feathers ruffled, you know? So um, in saying that, I, I can remember being on a university campus and outside of you know, the athletic department, I was the only professional of color on that campus. And so having to build up this DEI structure um, on the campus, um, I was always the only one, the first. And it, it was, I'm not really easily intimidated. So I can't really say I was intimidated, but it was uncomfortable because I had to have these tough conversations in these spaces that were not always inviting. Um, so again, I'm by nature an introvert. Nobody believes me, but I really am. Uh, but you know, again, I, I did not have the privilege of being intimidated because I was advocating on behalf of others who were not given the opportunity to sit at this table. So even now in my position now, as uncomfortable as it could be to be the only one or the first. Thankfully, I have a team that I work with uh, who is inspiring. Um, I felt compelled. I have this opportunity. I'm the first. I'm built for it. You know, I grew up from, I'm from the South. I'm a Southern girl, South Carolina, born and raised. Um, these spaces do not scare me. I was always the only girl in the advanced classes in high school, me and my best friend. So we were the only two Black people. So I'm not afraid to speak up. And I have to understand that I am, again, that weight of representing um, a lot of people coming behind me. If I don't speak up and articulate, then they're going to say, you know, maybe we made a wrong decision by bringing this person in because they don't meet the standards. Um, so I just, I don't have, or we don't have the privilege of, of shrinking down. We have to rise to the occasion. Um, so if you've been given the opportunity to be one of the first then you take that and you say, I'm going to run with it and do as best as you can. You are going to have to find a network of people who are also the first so that you can have people to go to and, you know, vents because you need <laughs> you need venting power because everybody doesn't understand. Um, but I, I feel like you don't have you don't have the privilege to shrink. We must be in these spaces, be present and um, advocate. Um, for those who, who have not been invited. And then we can create our own table so we can invite whoever we want to. Okay. I really like that you both have, have said that. And it does sound to me like it is really about um, taking control of the spaces that, that we are in and demanding respect. And so does that happen 
before law school? Does it happen in law school? And the reason why I brought that up is because one of our audience members is asking if you could speak to the attitudes that are exhibited towards Black students, particularly Black female students that are attending law school. Um, although you don't necessarily have to address the specific incidents, there were negative opinions that were uh, that were exhibited by a certain law school on the East Coast who shall rename, remain nameless. But then there are, do you think there are certain negativities that are exhibited towards Black female law students? And if so, um, did you experience that and did you have to overcome it? Or do you feel that that didn't necessarily happen to you during law school? Okay, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, because I didn't hear about what happened on the East Coast. And um, I will say that I, I really didn't have a negative experience. And I don't think, I can't speak for the other black female students that were there, but, um, you know, we just, I guess we just came back in the time I was in a law school in the 90s. Um, didn't have that experience at my school. Can't say it isn't there now, but it wasn't. Um, and, but, I, but I would say, uh, I don't think we should just, we should focus on it. That doesn't mean we ignore it. It just means that it doesn't define us. <laughs> I always look at it as, as like, that to me just, tells me about the people who are saying these things or the actions of them. Not, it's not an indicative of who I am. Just because someone thinks it doesn't make it so. So, uh, and I can't control what others do. I mean, you're in law school, if you're there to get an education, to get a degree, to do, to move on, you know, no one's gonna stop you. So I don't distract it by the noise because I believe that when you get pulled into the fight and into those distractions, it takes you away from following your purpose meeting your goals, why you were there. Um, if that fight somehow helps you, you know, prove your skill sets, improve your communication skills, improve your advocacy skills, and you can use that in a way that you can later use that as a career enhancing, as a resume writer or something because you believe in it, then, then do that, use that and turn that negative into a positive. Take those lemons and make lemonade. But if it's not, stay focused. Stay on your path, stay on your purpose. Noise will keep going. It's not going to stop. Don't let it define you. Don't internalize it and keep it going. It just, just becomes something that just reflects it. I believe you shine the light and your light will and you just keep going and you find everybody else around you. So um, I don't tend to let those things bother me or distract me because I know who I am. I know what my people have contributed. I know my value. Um, and those things are just, you know, come from people who have a sense of black and there's something wrong. So I'm a bit dismissive of the negative uh, 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 incidents, unless they become physical and violent, then I get a little bit more concerned, but talk is cheap, in my opinion, and I just really don't have time for it. We've got bigger things that we have to achieve. So true. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Macon. Ms. Hackett, did you want to contribute? Actually, I was hoping you, like, flew over me. No, I, I am an alum, alum from Concord Law School. Um, and I didn't experience any of that. I also had a privilege of being um, virtual. Um, and I know that kind of, you know, overall, there was stigma to that not being a brick and mortar. How ironic that everybody is pretty much virtual now. So Concord was ahead of its time. I was very comfortable with it, even being in academia and having some of my colleagues Anyway, you didn't ask me about virtual. That was my plug for Concord. You're welcome. Um, but I didn't experience this, you know, anything, discrimination, or anything as a Black female law student. Um, I did wonder where were my law professors that, that looked like me? Why didn't I have more professors of color? Which is why Shakira, I was like, well, where were you? <laughs> um, but, you know, I did want to see more. And that could have been my DEI hat being, you know, placed on my head. I really wanted to see more um, diversity with my professors. But as a student, um, I, I felt very supported. Um, you know, maybe I can go when I got my master's degree. Um, again, there was a stigma on that. But, you know, for me, it's always a stigma as a, a, a person of color in these spaces that, you know, some people say you weren't invited to. Um, but as Ms. Macon said, you know, I don't care. You, you don't have to push me out. You know, uh, I draw the line in the sand like we used to do in South Carolina. You cross that line, we got a problem. I'm going to be here. So I, I never allow the naysayers to, to bother or hinder me. I'm going to defy the odds. 
um, and and have done so proudly. So, but as far as my law school experience, I had no nothing. Um, I would say with my law school experience, I think it was maybe maybe ten to twenty percent of negativity I received the three years, and that was from students. That was not from faculty. So, um, Southern Illinois University, Carbondale is a very conservative area, but I had a great time. I loved law school. I think I love school. That's why I have three degrees. Um, but what I can say is that uh, my grandmother said, "What people think about you is none of your business." And so, let's be honest that um, until, like, as Miss Macon said, until there's an actual physical physical manifestation of how they feel. Um, I would not necessarily be concerned about it. And, and we also have to understand that there will always be the, oh, it was affirmative action. That's why you got here. Oh, it was, there's always some reason. And, and whatever reason you think that I got here, that's fantastic. I'm not concerned about it. I have to keep pushing along and get this law degree. So I definitely think that there is, um, depending on where you go, there can be some negative attitudes towards just the black student body in general. Um, just assumptions that are made, but they're clearly just assumptions. And so um, until, again, there's, there's some type of physical manifestation about that, that assumption, you just have to move forward and, and plow ahead. So we are getting a little bit to the end. And so I did want to go into our future perspectives because um, as uh, Dean Pritkin uh, had mentioned earlier, we are all in different areas of the law. And so we have taken our law degrees and we have really expanded past hanging up your shingle or just going into the local law firm for a profession. So considering that, um, in your opinions, what are the areas of law or industry? Um, do you see that are providing prop opportunities for black women attorneys to be in the forefront? Ms. Macon? I love this question. I really did. Because um, I think that now more than ever, I think we need to be prosecutors. I think we need to be judges. I think we need to be in state legislatures. I think we need to be so a place where um, we can help on the criminal end. And I think, and I, and I, and I remember if I had to do law school again, and sometimes like, oh, maybe I should go back and do this. I would go be a prosecutor. They obviously have more power than the, than the legal aid. Of the, and I know that's what you used to do, so no right. But I think that that's when the judgment can actually apply. And I think you could do more. Decide, you know, what level of, of severity this crime actually deserves. Um, maybe you could put, and I, maybe there's politics behind it, but that's my romantic notion of it. And I, so I think, you know, the prosecutorial side, um, judges clearly, because uh, I think the criminal justice system needs to from, not just from the outside, but from men that deals with the biases and the stereotypes and the sit in the black robes and how they would that justice. And I think of color on those benches, I hope that that would start to equalize and level the playing field to some extent. Next level would be the legislatures. State law, I used to think running for Congress or other was a thing. And I now have realized that the power is in the states. We really need to occupy and rise to the level of state legislature. That means state representatives, state senators, they need to have more people of color, they need to have more women of color, because those are the laws that are being made that really affect me and you. Not at the federal level. Federal is pushing more power down to the states, and the states are making the laws that determine your budget for your schools, how your money is going to different neighborhoods, which types of services you get to have, and that's decided by people who don't look like us. But state legislators in this country are Republican than they are Democrat. And that needs to change. And so I think that if you're going to law school, please think about public service. Think about those areas because I think you can make a difference in social justice or something. That's my plug. <laughs> Jackie, do you have you have a quick answer for us before you turn it over back to I you? I mean, everything she said, and I want to just highlight state legislation, like there are policy writers, um, policy advisors. I mean, I am loving the space that I'm in. And um, I just think that if others knew that it was opportunities here, I mean, to know that I'm affecting systemic change, not what people see. I don't have to be the face of it, but in the background, the person that's writing this legis, I'm on a team of legislative writers. I am helping to interpret this and it's making systemic changes for everybody in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It is removing biases and discrimination and racism from the root. I am super excited about this. And I think that if you will start um, engaging and researching, state is where you need to be. I, I, I agree with you wholly. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Macon and Ms. Black Hackett. We really appreciate your insight, your honesty, and your clarity this afternoon. I'm going to turn it back over to Dean Pritkin. Thank you. Thank you, Shakira, and thank you to all of you um, for these fantastic uh, insights. I uh, really appreciate you sharing your perspectives on a, on a wide variety of topics. Um, I think it's very beneficial for uh, our audience to hear these different perspectives from people who um, you know, are in positions of leadership in uh, the public sector and the private sector. Um, hopefully this is a message of, of hope and encouragement for, for those who are considering um, moving into uh, leadership roles. Uh, this can serve as an inspiration for people as well. That is all the time we have. I hope everyone in the audience has enjoyed um, and the archive will be available soon. If those want to uh, watch it again, share it with friends or colleagues who you think might be interested in hearing about this. Uh, so thank you all those in the background, speaking of making things happen in the background, who technologically made this webinar happen. It certainly doesn't happen by itself. Um, so thank you all and I look forward to uh, hearing from you and hearing about great things that you're doing and hopefully our audience will join us in our next Distinguished Speaker webinar series, which we hope to be announcing soon. So thank you all and have a good day.